This is a seven English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Chapter 141. Anthony, you are too damn lucky. Central Plaza. Link, are you all right? A worried but familiar voice rang in Link's ears. When he spun around, he saw Herrera rushing over with a group of magicians. Yilliard and Riley were also amongst the first few people who reached the incident site. The destruction caused by the three flame blast spells was devastating, creating a hell-like scene. It had also alarmed the entire hot spring city. Herrera and the rest were only the first groups of people rushing to the site. Behind them were the Mission Intelligence, Section 3, the Royal Guards and the Royal Battle Magicians, all making their way to the central plaza at top speed. This incident was way too horrifying. The situation was getting more chaotic as more people arrived. Link stayed vigilant while staying right beside Prince Philip to prevent any more tragedies from happening. The sight of Herrera and his friends unharmed calmed him down slightly. I am fine. However, a lot of people are injured. Prince Philip also requires attention and help. Herrera's attention was then diverted to the high elf beside Link. From her accumulation of wisdom, she could more or less infer the cause and motive of the attack. This was definitely a planned murder of a royal high elf on the side of the Silver Moon. She immediately turned and told Iliard, The situation is pretty serious. Bring Riley back to the inn to pack up and leave for East Cove Higher Magic Academy. The situation was beyond the powers of Iliard and Riley. If they continued to stay in the capital, they would only become Herrera's source of worry and distract her from the investigation. Link, on the other hand, had once fought beside her and even played a crucial role in the Battle of Miss Basin. She had already considered him a fellow comrade. What about you? Iliard's heart sank. He knew the situation was grave. The incident has way too many implications. The kingdom might require my assistance. Herrera was prepared. She was a master of the East Cove Higher Magic Academy and was known by name in the Royal Kingdom. She was even accorded the title of a duchess. She naturally had to stay and offer her assistance in the face of such a tragedy. All right. Iliard held Riley's hand and left the plaza ruins hastily. As he left, his eyes swept across the plaza ruins. There were two clear lines of impact on the ground and in the middle of those traces were two complete bodies. They were one of the few bodies that managed to remain intact through the incident. When Iliard first saw the signs, he did not think much about it. However, it hit him after a while. That was a controlled outburst of energy. It should be the work of Link. Has he already reached that level? Link basically stayed in the academy this whole time, communicating with Iliard over their recent magic discoveries. Iliard had of course heard some rumors of Link's strength but thought nothing of it. However, now that he had seen the aftermath of Link's battle, he was hit with the realization of Link's true power. While they were around the same age, Link had already surpassed him in many aspects probably even in ways far beyond his imagination. Iliard quickened his pace at this thought. He could feel the gap widening and had no time to waste. He had to speed up his progress, or he would end up chasing after Link's shadow indefinitely. The ruins had attracted a crowd. Many of them had a look of horror on their faces, stunned by the image right in front of their eyes. Who would be crazy enough to do this? Oh my, this is Juan Master Hermira! Someone had found the corpse of the well-known enchanter. This is Master Dallas. Another person recognized the identity of a level 5 magician. Dallas was a wind elemental magician from the Southern Magician Alliance. He was probably here to join in on the fun of the festival. Little did he know that he would lose his life on such a joyous occasion. The future was truly unpredictable. People who were around the edges of the attack were still alive but suffered injuries. As they were treated, screams of pain could be heard echoing through the street. Herrera joined forces with Link to protect the prince, and she held her staff out in alert. Two minutes later, the royal guards arrived together with a royal magician, an acquaintance of Herrera. Master Grinth, you have arrived, Herrera greeted. Grinth was a level six master magician. He was fifty-eight years old, and his hair had turned white. He had a serious expression, and his wrinkles seemed as though they were carved onto his face by a sharp knife. He scanned across the central plaza. When he saw Herrera and Link together with Prince Philip, 
he heaved a sigh of relief. An explosion in the most crowded area of the capital was an unprecedented tragedy. If the Prince of the High Elves were to be affected by this incident, it would be a disaster. It was thus fortunate that the Prince was alive and not injured. Grint then commanded the royal guards beside him. You form a team to treat the injured. You guys each bring a team to maintain order. The guards immediately dispersed to execute their own duties. After giving some instructions to his assistant, he quickly walked towards Prince Philip. Grinth immediately bowed and apologized for the trauma caused upon reaching the prince. He then looked Herrera and asked, Moira, what exactly happened here? Grinth and Anthony were best friends. As Herrera was Anthony's favorite disciple, Grinth was naturally on good terms with her. Furthermore, not only was she the strongest magician in the area, she was also standing right beside Prince Philip when he arrived. It seemed only natural to ask her for information. However, he had inquired the wrong person this time. Herrera pushed Link forward and said, I do not have first-hand experience of the situation. This is my disciple Link. When the explosion happened, he was nearby. He is also the one who saved the prince. Grint then diverted his attention to Link. He saw a black-haired teenager with a very vague magic aura. Link was concealing his aura, and he was not more than twenty years of age. His heart was immediately filled with a little contempt. Out of respect for Herrera, he said, Tell me exactly what happened here. Grint was a senior in magic. Naturally, Link greeted him with respect before recounting the incident in detail. Finally, he pointed to the two corpses lying in the trails of his spell and said, There were three dark elves involved. One of them ran away while the other two were killed by me. It was an emergency, and I did not have the liberty to control my strength. Hence, I was unable to keep them as captives. Grinth was extremely surprised. Firstly, he was surprised at the Dark Elves' involvement in this assault. Secondly, he was both impressed and shocked by Link's battle abilities. Grinth was not idling while he listened to Link's recount. His sights were set on the plaza ruins and he managed to get a rough understanding of the situation that unfolded. There were six human bodies with a huge open wound on their heads and no burnt injuries. Link claimed that they were assassins which Prince Philip confirmed. From their equipment, Grinth could determine that the six of them were at least level three in strength. If Link had used a spell that covered a large area to kill all of them at once, he would not be this surprised. However, Link had chosen to cast six individual low-level spells. From what he had observed, the six assassins were defeated before they even got the chance to react. What impressive spellcasting speed! Grinth gasped. He also saw two huge burnt fan-shaped trails which were more than 90 feet in length. From the remnant elemental energy, he could tell that it was a level 4 spell. According to Link, he was ambushed by three dark elves at that point in time. To be able to cast two consecutive level 4 spells in the midst of an ambush, what kind of skill does that take? Grinth was dumbfounded. As he listened, he carefully observed the young man standing in front of him. He looks extremely young and is clad in a gray magic robe. He is holding a wand in his hand. A Domingo crystal. What exquisite workmanship. Such a unique rune arrangement. Is this an epic wand? Why have I not heard of it before? The most important equipment to a magician was the wand. An epic wand would thus definitely be well known amongst magicians. However, this was Grintha's first time seeing this wand. There could only be one explanation which was that the wand was newly crafted. Anthony kept bragging that there was a genius in the academy who had achieved level 4 despite his young age. He also mentioned his unimaginable magic talent. Is this the guy? Originally, he simply dismissed the idea as preposterous. He had always believed the young man was merely talented. His tender age would suggest that his experience with an understanding of magic was nowhere near satisfactory. However, the battle scene had proved him wrong. The details had proven that this young man was a lot stronger than people of his age. Many of his skills appeared to be original as well, so much so that Grinth was not able to comprehend the battle scene completely. Anthony is too damn lucky. If it was me, I would have also crafted an epic wand for him. Grinth could not help but be envious. If Grinth had known that the wand was created by Link, there was no telling how impressed he would be. 
This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Chapter 142 The Gift from the High Elf Prince Although he was very much surprised at Link's revelations, Grintha's mind was calm. That was usually the case for a powerful magician like him. He didn't show any of his emotions on his face. After listening to Link, he turned towards the corpses behind him and noticed the dark purple blood on them. This was an irrefutable characteristic of Dark Elves and taking Link's detailed explanation into account, there was no doubt that the calamity was the Dark Elves' doing. Ira! shouted Grinth, calling for his assistant. Bring a team of guards here immediately and go get us a carriage! Make it quick! Fear had begun to creep up on him now. Once his assistant was gone, he then turned towards Herrera. Moira, it's not safe here, he said. We must escort the prince back to the royal palace and I suppose your disciple should come along as well. Grinth had fully acknowledged Link's strength by now. He would be glad to have him with the company as they escorted the prince back to the palace as he could act as an excellent guard. Moreover, this young man was the direct witness of the attempted assassination and had even saved the prince's life. Grinth was sure that the king would like to meet such an important figure when he heard of the details of the incident. To this request, Herrera and Link naturally agreed. Soon, the carriage stopped at the edge of the ruins of the street. Grintha's people surrounded Prince Philip and escorted him into the carriage, and they headed straight to the palace. The guards then surrounded the carriage all along the journey as Prince Philip, Herrera, Grinth, and Link sat inside. For extra protection, Grinth had cast a powerful level 6 defense spell around them as well. They then traveled all the way to the palace without any incident. As they entered the palace gates, a notification popped up on the interface. Mission, rescue, first step completed. Player received 60 Omni points. Mission second step, exposing the dark curtain, current progress two thirds. The reward for the second part of the mission was the mysterious glyph of soul. He checked his current progress and discovered that he would have received the anticipated reward had he killed the third dark elf. It's a pity the swordswoman managed to escape. There should be more chances to pursue her later, thought Link, as a way to comfort himself. I've done my best, and it's too late to catch up with her now, anyway. After arriving at the palace, the security guards were taken over by the heavily armored members of the King's Guard. Grint disappeared into one of the many buildings in the palace complex to arrange the royal security affairs. Link and Herrera, on the other hand, were lead to a sitting room in the palace. Grint had mentioned that the King might want to meet them. Soon after settling down in the sitting room, a messenger came in to inform them of King Leon's order, though it had nothing to do with Link but was instead an order for the reputed magician Herrera to join the royal council. As an unknown young magician, Link would have to wait a little longer, alone in the sitting room. And so, Link was left there all alone in the vast empty room. It seemed as if everyone had forgotten his presence there. Still, Link was above letting such thoughts bother him. He waited there patiently giving no thoughts to the apparent disregard the courtiers had shown to his reputation. He clearly understood that only people who had gained the king's utmost trust and confidence could join the royal council at this time of emergency. The members of this esteemed council had the highest capabilities, qualifications, and reliability. While it might be true that he had shown exceptional capabilities so far, he had still risen too quickly and had basically no established position in society. He hadn't even met the king himself so it would be impossible for Link to gain the king's trust at the moment. As he was starting to get bored waiting, he took out his sketches of the flame blast enchantment bracelets and began to work on them. It was intended for the black-dressed woman. Although they hadn't exchanged more than a few words between them and Link didn't even know her name at this point, the woman had even used a taboo dark magic spell in front of him not too long ago. He still wanted to fulfill the promise that he had given to her. Never mind, he thought. I'll just keep my distance from her from now on. Flame Blast was a level 4 spell. In order to fix it to a bracelet, he must create a bracelet with an intricate structure and pattern. This wasn't a simple task at all, so Link was quickly immersed in the planning that forgot the flow of time. Just as he was engrossed in his work on the sketch, Link suddenly heard a sound of soft footsteps beside him. When he turned his gaze towards the source of the sound, he saw Prince Philip standing not too far away staring at him. 
Prince Philip was only an insignificant minor character in the game because Link had never even encountered him in his previous life. This might be because the gaming company ignored him, as he played no important roles in the main plot of the game. Or maybe, it was just not his time to shine yet. Anyway, Link's impression of the prince was completely blank before he met him today. In reality though, this person was a high-born royal prince of the Isle of Dawn, so Link hurriedly bowed when he noticed him in the room and addressed him respectfully as, Your Highness. As he bowed, Link began to find the prince's presence there a bit strange. Link was only a normal magician now, and he was only a younger son of a minor viscount. Their disparities in rank were huge, so there was no reason for the prince to come find him here himself. Link had assumed that after he was escorted safely back to the palace, the mission would be over and they would have nothing more to do with each other. So what was the prince doing here? When Link turned around, he saw a hint of guilt on Prince Philip's near-perfect face. I'm sorry, said the prince. Have I disturbed you? Oh, not at all, your highness, answered Link with a smile. I am an enchantment magician and I was merely working on my sketches for my next magic gear since I had nothing else to do here. Did you come to see me? Philip nodded and glanced at the sketch in Link's hand as he approached him. The sketch was elaborate and was full of complicated parts and indecipherable magic runes. He couldn't understand a thing on the sketch so he turned his gaze back to Link. I am deeply indebted to you, sir, said the prince. You've saved my life. Your Highness, said Link, I only did what I should have done. Link had estimated that the High Elf Prince must have some important business to come and meet him here himself. Although he was curious to find out what the prince's motives were, he posed no direct questions to him and opted to wait patiently for the prince to bring it up himself instead. Sure enough, Prince Philip shook his head in reply to Link's modest protest and soon revealed his true reason for this meeting. Since you've done what you should, then I must do what I should as well, said the prince. A simple thank you won't be sufficient in expressing my gratitude to you. As he finished his sentence, the High Elf Prince then took out a delicate little wooden box with a greenish-brown hue. Its outer layer was carved into beautiful patterns of trees and flowers. The Prince then thrust the box into Link's hands. Here, said Prince Philip, it's my gift to you. The wooden box was the work of a famous carving master among the elves, but that was beside the point. What was most important was the contents of the box. He had no idea what use this object had or what its specialty was, but it was what the prophet had given Prince Philip. The prophet was a mysterious figure who had originated from the human world. He held a lofty position in the high elf court, and was even respected and revered by the queen of the Isle of Dawn herself. Prince Philip remembered the prophet's last instruction before he left very clearly. The contents of the box are of no use to high elves, he said, but it is of immense value to a human being. I'll give this box to you now, so you can give it to the right person when you are in the human kingdom. How do I know I've met the right person to give this to? The prince remembered asking the prophet. If you think the person is the right one, then that is the one you give this to, answered the prophet. Just listen to your heart, my prince. In fact, besides discussing the alliance between the two kingdoms, Prince Philip had come to the Norton Kingdom expressly for this purpose. The answer given to his question about the right person was vague and confusing, and the prince wasn't sure if he fully understood it. He had been carefully observing many people these days yet none of them had struck him as the right person to give the prophet's gift to. If they didn't even make him feel like they were the right person, Prince Philip assumed that they must not be the right one. That was why the wooden box stayed with him until this moment. But right now, the prince felt confident that Link was the most suitable and worthiest person to receive the mysterious gift, which was why he snuck out of his room to meet him. Link had no idea there was so much meaning behind the gift. He thought nothing of what the contents of the box could be. All he thought was that it was a normal gift given to him as a token of gratitude, which he humbly accepted. Thank you, your highness, he said courteously as he received the wooden box with both of his hands. I don't know what else to give you, said the prince with a friendly smile. But apart from this wooden box, you will now receive the friendship of the High Elves. You'll forever be my honored guest on the Isle of Dawn, and you'll always be welcomed there. I shall never forget it, replied Link. I snuck out just to meet you, said Prince Philip. 
So think it's time for me to go back now before they realize I'm gone. Farewell, Link. As he waved his hand, the prince quickly turned around and went out of the room. The meeting with Prince Philip had happened so quickly and seemed to be a bolt out of the blue for Link. When the prince was gone, he began to examine the fist-sized wooden box in his hand, eager to find out what was inside it. Is it jewelry? Or maybe a type of precious magic material? Link was just about to open the box when suddenly, there were footsteps at the door. Link didn't want anyone else to know of Prince Philip's gift to him, so he quickly hid it inside his storage pendant. Not long afterwards, there was a voice calling for him at the doorway. Mr. Link, His Majesty would like to meet you. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Chapter 143, Time to Mature The Parliament Hall of King Leon While Link was waiting in the lounge, King Leon, Duke Abel, Grinth, Herrera and the head of military intelligence, Section 3 had all arrived at the Parliament Hall. Everyone had a grim look on their faces, especially the head of MI3, Duke Stan. His expression was so gloomy it looked like someone splashed ink on his face. When Gladstone City was suddenly ambushed and almost taken by the Death Hand, he had already lost much of his reputation and prestige. This time, the Death Hand was once again a step faster than him and successfully assaulted the capital in the middle of a festival. As the military chief of MI3, he was ashamed. My lord, I will resign as the head of MI3 as punishment for my incompetence. He broke the silence. King Leon was usually a reasonable and calm person. However, this time, he was infuriated and lost his usual graceful demeanor. Shut up! You will have to leave, but not before you settle the mess you created. The hall fell into silence once again. Everyone knew that the king was truly furious. If word got out that an attack of such scale happened in the capital of the Norton Kingdom during a magician's fair, their reputation would go down the drain. The Norton Kingdom would then become the laughingstock of the entire Fireman continent. Putting the embarrassing issues aside, they started discussing steps to recover from this assault. They had to give a reasonable explanation to the people of Hot Springs City and assure them that the capital was still safe. If they failed to give the citizens assurance, their insecurities might once again be used by the enemy to plan for an attack of an even larger scale. Fortunately, there was ample evidence pointing towards the Dark Elves as the culprits. Two Dark Elven corpses were left at the scene, justifying that hypothesis. This is already the second time, those red-eyed vampires are going overboard. At least Gladstone City was on the borders. To think that they had the courage to infiltrate all the way into the capital and deliver such a cruel blow to the human race. We have to fight back. Your Majesty, it is time. But we are not ready. You can never be fully ready for a war. The Dark Elves will not wait for us. A heated discussion ensued in the hall. After a while, they came to a conclusion that revenge against the Dark Elves had to be taken. King Leon kept silent the entire time, listening intently to the discussion. When a conclusion was reached, he took a deep breath before instructing his assistant. Stan, I want the Dark Elf who escaped to be captured alive. Do you understand? Yes. This incident had completely ruined Duke Stan's reputation. If he let this Dark Elf escape once again, he would not even have the face to stand in front of his ancestors. Bereave, this Dark Elf seems quite strong. We will probably need some professionals. You will work with Stan. I understand. Areev patted his chest armor. He was also embarrassed by this incident. The twenty guards that he picked were completely wiped out by the flame blast spell assault. They were all elite soldiers that he handpicked for this mission. To think that they were done in before they could do anything. We will also have to catalyze the war in the north. We will have our revenge. King Leon said. They desperately needed a victory. Only a victory could fully appease the people's hatred towards the Dark Elves. It was Duke Abel's turn to speak. Abel was the king's brother and was 38 years old, 10 years younger than King Leon. He was energetic and charismatic, making him a good leader. He was also a level 5 warrior and currently the general of the kingdom. He stood up and gave a cruel smile. Your majesty, you will attain a glorious victory. I hope so. King Leon nodded. His brother was cruel and ruthless. 
King Leon was still able to control Abel ten years ago, however, Abel just got more ambitious every year. Just recently, Abel had begun to challenge his orders. King Leon was actually looking for a chance to weaken Abel's military authority in the kingdom, but the occurrence of such a tragic incident left him no choice but to put off this plan to a later date. They then proceeded with the discussion of other issues such as reparations to the people, appeasing Prince Philip, stocking up enough food, the preparations for war and so on, not missing out on a single detail. In the end, everyone was assigned a task and left to execute them immediately. King Leon turned towards Herrera only after the last person left the room and said, I heard that your disciple Link was the reason Prince Philip is still alive. I would like to meet him if it is possible. The servant then went to summon Link to the Parliament Hall. In the meantime, King Leon continued, Master Mora, tell me about this disciple of yours. What kind of person is he? King Leon had actually already read the report on Link given to him by Duke Stan and had an understanding of Link's achievements. However, he should not judge a person merely from the information he gleaned from the report, even if it was assembled by the head of the Kingdom Intelligence Agency. It was wise to seek a second opinion. Herrera stood up and greeted the king before saying, Your Majesty, in my eyes, my disciple is a perfect magician. King Leon was slightly taken aback before smiling. Perfect? That is an extremely high appraisal. He spoke again after a short pause. I always knew that he had a rare talent battling with magic, but I never expected him to be this powerful. I have plans to confer him the title of commander of the magician's troop in the north. Do you think he has what it takes? Herrera fell silent for a moment before shaking her head. Your Majesty, he is still young and his power still needs some time to mature. Furthermore, magicians his age are often rebellious and dislike authority. I feel that he is still unsuitable. King Leon mused. Indeed, I was too impatient. He was not making an empty promise. An incident indeed happened in the north some time ago. When the magician's troop fought against the dark elf magicians in a minor conflict, the kingdom's magician suffered a slight loss. His niece Annie then wrote him a strength assessment report for both forces. With a total score of 10 points, the Norton Kingdom magician troop would at most score 6 points on the scale, while the Dark Elves scored an 8. The strength of the magician's troop was often the deciding factor in a war between nations. If their magician's troop was indeed lacking in strength, they would likely lose in an official battle as well. As they were still not in an official war, there was time to make amendments. Leon had been desperately trying to recruit magicians with combat experience, so much so that he watered down the restrictions present in the Norton Kingdom constitution. Even the vagabond magicians who only knew a few spells were also paid royalties if they were willing to enlist. Link's actions in Gladstone City turned the tables around and allowed the Norton Kingdom to achieve victory. His performance on Jade Street was even more amazing. He defeated three strong opponents. Furthermore, he was from the East Cove Higher Magic Academy, making him an officially recognized magician. This was exactly the person they were looking for. On the other hand, what Herrera said also made sense. After thinking for a moment, King Leon let go of the idea. This man was destined to be a towering tree, a pillar of support for the human race. However, he was merely a small sapling at this moment. Although he already seemed to be tall and strong enough, he was definitely lacking in experience. He should be allowed to mature for a longer period of time. However, he had already decided to make good use of him. It was time for him to get into his good books. At that moment, the servant brought Link into the Parliament Hall. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Chapter 144, The King's Rewards In the game, King Leon was about 40 years old. He had a lean face, a head of gray hair and a gentle nature. Garbed in his luxurious royal garments, he was just the perfect picture of a gentleman. He was also a wise king no matter which point of view one could judge him from. Although he had the rotten luck of being the king of Norton when it fell to the dark side. I have never committed any sins or made any grave mistakes, yet why is my kingdom falling into the abyss while it's in my hands? Those were his last words. He didn't live to see the day when the kingdom of Norton collapsed completely. On the eve of the collapse, he was killed by his most beloved niece, Princess Annie who had by then gone mad. 
Not only was his head cut off, even his soul was sucked into an evil demon device that was in Annie's hands, imprisoning him even in his afterlife. Because of this, he held the first spot in Fireman's top three most tragic figures. But right now, none of these events had happened yet. When Link saw the king, he thought he looked just like the king in the game, but with some crucial differences. Because he met the tragic king a year earlier from the main timeline in the game, he didn't have that much gray hair on his head and his wise eyes had not yet been darkened by despair and frustration. Your majesty, said Link in a humble tone. He took a deep bow and performed a ceremonial gesture that a magician would do to another magician of a higher rank. Take a seat, said the king as he waved his hand. Servants in the throne room then led Link to his designated seat. King Leon waited for Link to settle down as he looked on with a gentle smile on his face. Annie has been telling me about you, he said. To be frank, I was a bit skeptical when she told me about how you saved her life and the whole city during the massacre in Gladstone. But now that I've heard of what happened here today, I finally believe everything she said about you. The court magicians have already divulged everything that transpired in the square of Jade Street to the king, everything from what spells were used and the details of what went on in the battle were revealed to him with nothing left out. King Leon could make out from the reports that there was indeed a very powerful magician at the scene, a magician so powerful that only a few others in this kingdom could rival his strength. In fact, he might be the only one with these kinds of capabilities right now because the other magicians were academic scholars. They were obsessed with abstract pursuits like discovering the true nature of reality and the world and thought fighting in battles should be left to the crude warriors. That was the reason why the battle mages in the army were usually those of average skills and limited knowledge and who knew that they had no future in academia. In addition, they were born into families having low status. These magicians were looked down upon by the scholarly magicians and because of that, these battle mages would usually hold themselves in low regard as well. He would be surprised to find another magician like Link in the kingdom, someone who possessed high talent and battle skills and who had a promising future in academia if he chose to go down that path. In this regard, the king estimated that the Dark Elf Kingdom of Pralink would also be facing the same problems, though probably not as serious as the Norton Kingdom. Because of this, King Leon had planned to assign Link to the battlefield in the north as the commander of the Magic Legion in the army. Meanwhile, Link was still unclear of the reason why the king had summoned him. Thus he decided to respond with utmost courtesy and humility, just to be safe. Your majesty, said Link, I only did what duty and honor compelled me to do. It is just as you said, nodded King Leon, you did what duty and honor compelled you to do, and so I shall do the same. Alder. Then, a white-haired scholar walked in slowly, holding a thick book in his hand as he approached the king reverently. He flipped the book open and placed it on the reading table next to the throne. The eagle-eyed Link noticed that the book was titled The Land Records of the Kingdom. His heart began to beat faster as he realized what the book title would entail, though he managed to keep a calm facade. The reason was simple, in the Kingdom of Norton, whenever the king was presented with the book, it meant that the king was about to reward someone with a piece of land. Link was about to receive his own piece of land. In the game, he was already a level, 7 magician and had climbed up through the ranks to become the commander of a legion in the army before he was rewarded with his own land. Although it was only a small piece of land with an area of about 10 miles, he had received enormous profits from it, plus everyone who inhabited the land would address him as my lord and bow to him whenever they met him. He'd even had young and beautiful maids working in his residence. All in all, it was simply a blessed life to be a landowner. The king sat on the throne as he flipped through the book quietly. He stopped after flipping more than a couple pages into the book and turned his gaze back to Link. There's a wasteland called Ferd Wilderness southeast of the Gervant Forest. The land there is poor and infertile, the climate is insufferable with its constant harsh winds. No one wanted to have anything to do with this piece of land, but if you like, this wasteland with a radius of more than a hundred miles will be yours. Herrera couldn't hold in her thoughts any longer, so she stood up the minute the king finished his sentence. Your majesty, she said, please pardon my effrontery, but how could you reward such a desolate land to someone who had made a genuine contribution? Herrera had been so happy to see that the king was going to reward Link with land. She knew that such rewards were only given to the best of men, 
especially to those who had made an exceptional contribution to the military. Link had rescued the city of Gladstone, that could be considered as a great military contribution. And since the king had decided to reward Link for his achievements, shouldn't he be given something decent instead of this ghastly place with no profitable value like the Ferd Wilderness? The Ferd Wilderness was an infamous desolate wasteland in the Norton Kingdom. Although it was connected to the sea in the east, the sea there was full of jagged reefs which made it an unsuitable site for commercial ports or even small ordinary docks. There would be at least three large-scale hurricanes coming in from the sea every year, and the squalls there could lift a grown man off his feet and carry him off. Needless to say, the soil there was so infertile that even weeds wouldn't grow on it, let alone crops. Although its area was vast, the population there consisted of no more than 5,000 people, and all of them had to eke out a living in very poor conditions. In fact, even robbers, bandits and fugitives who had little choice for the places they could go were reluctant to go there. Only those who were extremely vicious and extremely desperate ended up in the terrible place. King Leon shrugged and stretched out his hands in a gesture of helplessness in response to Herrera's protest. I'm afraid the other pieces of land are already owned by someone else, said the king. And the rest is either too small or is under too much dispute. So what do you think, Link? If you're unwilling to accept this reward, I can give you gold coins instead. Maybe I can give you 10,000 gold coins and award you the title of Baron, how about that? This was his original intention, of course. Link was just too young and his position in society was still unestablished. Though he did make some great contributions to the kingdom, if he was to be rewarded with a piece of land that many coveted, it might elicit hatred and jealousy among his courtiers and bring unnecessary troubles to Link as well. The king had only offered the land to show him that there was the possibility of being handsomely rewarded if he continued to help the kingdom. In fact, his real idea was to offer Link a barren land that nobody wanted so he would reject it, and then he would reward him with gold coins instead. This was the plan that the king had in mind, and it was one that he had employed many times before. Link was amused at how this reward from the king had turned into something that sounded more like a bargain in the market. He had to hold in his laugh, though. As for the Ferd Wilderness, he knew from the game that it was indeed barren and lifeless. It was, after all, called one of the three worst places in Fireman. Players who were rewarded with this piece of land after their service in the army were all so frustrated that many of them even deleted their accounts because of it. That was until one player accidentally discovered that the black clay in this territory developed an exceptional anti-magic property when baked into bricks. This player then sold the bricks and made a vast fortune from it. He even made it into the list of top 30 richest players in the gaming system, with the nickname of, the King of Bricks. Furthermore, the area of the land awarded to that player didn't exceed 10 square miles anyway. But now the king was offering a piece of land that was hundreds of miles wide to him, it was simply a deal he couldn't refuse. Once he'd made enough money from the bricks, he would then use magic spells to change the squally climate of the Ferd Wilderness to make it more temperate. Who knew, maybe in 10 years he could turn the Ferd Wilderness into the Ferd Farm. However, even though Link was eager to accept the reward, he concealed the excitement and carefully chose the right words to ask the king another question. Your majesty, he said, may I ask what status I will have as the owner of this land? King Leon was stunned upon hearing this question. He didn't think that Link would accept this worthless piece of land. He gave it some considerations and finally came to a decision. Since he wanted this desert-like wasteland so much, then he would grant the young magician's wish and give it to him. You're a cunning young man, said the king, laughing. You wouldn't own the land as a commoner, of course. How would you like it if I make you a baron? I would be honored, your majesty, said Link. May I ask if the land and title would be hereditary? What a greedy young man, thought King Leon, his eyes widened. While it was true that Link had indeed made a great contribution, but it was far from enough to be worth such a big reward. He'd only offered the title and the land to show his generosity and to encourage the young man to keep up his good work. He never thought that Link would turn out to be so greedy. Who would have thought that land and title would not be good enough for him, and that he would be so bold as to demand them to be hereditary? Still, things had come to the point where King Leon had no choice but to concede to the demand. No one wanted the wasteland that was the Ferd Wilderness, anyway. 
Plus, there was no way to create any income or value out of the land. So even if there was honor in the title of baron, the rewards were little more than a sham once everything was considered. Yes, of course, said the king. Your land and title will be hereditary, so you can pass it on to your future son and he will pass it on to your grandson and so on. Are you satisfied now? Link was about to answer the king when Herrera tugged on his sleeve to stop him. Link, she whispered, don't you think it's better to choose the gold coins over the title? That piece of land would only be a burden to you. No amount of magic could transform it into anything close to profitable. She was only trying to help Link make the best decision for his own good. No matter how she considered it, it seemed to her that Link was choosing the less favorable option here. Still, Link's reply to her well-meant advice was a gentle shake of his head. Gold coins don't last very long, he whispered. I'd much prefer a land of my own. Your Majesty, said Link enthusiastically as he stood up, thank you very much for your rewards. I am very pleased and honored to be the recipient of your generosity. I'm glad you like it, said King Leon, laughing. At that moment Link was only a naive young nobleman who hadn't seen much of the world in the king's eyes. He might be exceptionally gifted in the area of magic, but he seemed to have very limited knowledge of practical matters, one could even say that he came off as slightly ignorant in worldly affairs. Of course, owning land was a good thing, but it also depended on the kind of land you owned and its location too. With a place like the Furred Wilderness in your possession, you might as well have owned nothing. But this wasn't necessarily a bad thing, either. King Leon liked to have such a talented and capable magician who was so easy to control under his wing. One never knew how they might come in handy one day. It's all settled, then, said the king. You should return to the academy for now. I will send the letter of declaration and title deed to you soon. As for the awarding ceremony, I'll let you know when I've found a good auspicious day for it. Since Link was only awarded the title of Baron, there wouldn't be much involved and only the two people present here right now were enough to make the awarding ceremony valid. Your Majesty, said Link as he raised to his feet, I am forever indebted to your generosity. It is only my way of encouraging you, young man, replied the king as he nodded gently. I hope that one day you will be the pride of the kingdom. These were general words of encouragement that King Leon had said to every young man he'd seen some potential in. In fact, he'd said it so many times before that they were almost a mechanical reflex instead of heartfelt. Nevertheless, whenever he looked back on this precise moment in the future when the Norton Kingdom's safety was in jeopardy, his heart was filled with gratitude. He thanked his past self for making such a wise investment. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Chapter 145, Reaping All Kinds of Rewards Herrera went straight back to the academy after leaving the palace to report on the incident on Jade Street to the dean. Link was only a magician with no rank or position at the moment, so there was no need for him to hurry anywhere. He took his time staying at an inn in the capital city, waiting for the title deed and declaration letter from the king. Despite the terrible calamity caused by the Dark Elves recently, the magician's fair still went on as usual. Not only did the size of the crowd at the fair not decrease, there were, in fact, more people now who flocked to this part of the city to visit the site of the disaster. Seeing that the fair was still going on, Herrera had placed Link's matchstick wand and his other magic gear at a magical equipment shop in Jade Street. Link was sure that someone would buy them up soon enough. Link stayed at the inn and didn't venture out anywhere at all. He spent all his time in his room working on the flame blast bracelet that was meant for the black-dressed lady. He'd completed the rough sketches for the bracelet in the palace and had spent another day perfecting the details. By early morning of the second day, he was ready to roll up his sleeves start the real work. He had all the best materials on hand, thorium, gold, and fire crystals. Furthermore, no one was there to interfere with his work. Thus, Link was able to devote all his energy to the intricate manipulation of the high-quality materials into complicated structure and patterns. As time went by, Link became more and more engrossed with his work that he began to take pleasure in it. There was nothing else in the world that he would rather be doing at that moment. The whole process lasted for three whole days, after which Link successfully produced a beautiful flame blast bracelet with its main body made of gold and its mana-conducting lines of thorium. 
The fire crystals were used as the nodes that made up the magic seal on the bracelet. The bracelet was shaped like a phoenix that would wrap around the wearer's wrist with its head connected to its tail. The phoenix was well known to die in a burst of flames and rise again from its ashes, so it was a becoming design to use in a flame blast bracelet. Each of its feathers was delicately rendered by Link's dexterous skills, and surrounding each feather were lines of thorium while beads of fire crystals were placed right in the middle of the feathers. They acted as magic seal nodes, with the biggest fire crystal bead making up the eye of the phoenix. It was truly an immaculate magic gear both in its design and in its function. The fire crystal that was the bird's eye was different from the rest on the feathers, though. The crystals on the feathers had sharp edges so they would sparkle as light danced on the bracelet surface when it moved. The fire crystal that was the eye of the phoenix, on the other hand, had been polished into a smooth teardrop shape that seemed to radiate with mysterious charm, in fact, it was the presence of this eye that had made the phoenix bracelet look so uncannily lifelike. Viewed simply from the aspect of its appearance, this bracelet was impeccable. As for the bracelet's functionality, Link had incorporated two very useful Supreme Magical Techniques modifications in the Flame Blast spell that was stored inside the Phoenix Bracelet, Resonance and Accuracy. He'd also designed a robust pattern for the runic line so that the spell wouldn't be misfired or destroyed unless if it was bent and distorted by an external force. And finally, there was the signature Link had left on the bracelet. Although it was just a gift he still thought leaving his signature on his work was a must because each piece of work successfully produced was a source of pride for the enchantment magician. And so Link left his signature on the inside of the bracelet where it would be hidden when worn. Now the bracelet was complete. Link's heart was filled with pride as he inspected the finished product. He even felt slightly reluctant to give it away to someone else. He then put away the bracelet and went back to his work table to check the materials that he had left. He discovered that he had an ounce of thorium, three ounces of gold and fifteen pieces of cut fire crystal left. Naturally, Link kept all these materials for his own use in the future. This was the time he really understood how much money an enchantment magician could make. He no longer wondered how Herrera could earn enough profits from her enchantment skills to buy a huge amount of magic materials. Even the leftover materials could be sold for an ample amount of gold coins. As his work was now done, all that was left was to wait patiently. Link was confident that the black-dressed woman would soon come to meet him, so in the meantime, he stayed in the inn reading his magic books. When he had time to spare, he would take the wooden box given to him by the High Elf Prince out and examine it. The wooden box was lovely and very well made with some masterful carving done on its surface. Imagine Link's confusion then, when he opened it and discovered that there was nothing but a thumb-sized white stone inside. Yes, it really was just an ordinary-looking stone and nothing else. The stone's only unique feature was probably its somewhat smooth surface, but other than that, Link simply couldn't see what was special about this rock. He couldn't detect a trace of mana or spot any runic patterns on the stone and there were no jolts of energy fluctuations coming from it at all, to put it simply, the white stone was indistinguishable from any other old rock you could find by the riverbank. The prince wouldn't play a joke on me, would he? Link wondered. What was he thinking giving me this white stone? Link was confounded and couldn't think of any reason why the prince would bestow him such an odd gift. After scrutinizing it for a while, a notification suddenly appeared on the interface. White stone, indestructible. Quality, unknown. Effects, unknown. Note, a gift from Prince Philip. Well, at least it was true that the stone was indestructible. Link had actually tried to use enchantment techniques to change its properties and appearance, but none of his current tricks had had any effects on the stone. If it hadn't been for this strange property, Link would definitely have thrown the stone into some corner and leave it there a long time ago. Could it be made of a material with too high a quality that it is beyond my capabilities to do anything to it? Link wondered. Could something like that exist, though? After examining it for a while longer Link finally gave up with a long and deep sigh. He then closed the lid of the wooden box and put it back in its place. That was the first time he'd come across such a mystifying object ever since arriving in this world. A day later, a messenger from the palace finally delivered the declaration letter and title deed from the king. Though these were only meant to be official documents, they were nevertheless of such a high quality that they seemed to be luxurious ornaments.
The documents were stamped with the royal seal which had magic properties and were so intricate that they were extremely difficult to forge. Most importantly, these documents plainly stated the king's declaration that Link was now a hereditary baron of the Norton Kingdom whose seat of power was at the Ferd Wilderness. The title deed had also clearly marked the boundaries at the southeastern and northwestern edge of the Ferd Wilderness, leaving no opportunities for disputes. One thing worth mentioning was how King Leon seemed to be afraid that the new baron would be too poor, so he put the coastal seas on the eastern side of the Ferd Wilderness under Link's ownership as well. Although the sea there was full of jagged reefs and unsuitable to be turned into ports, at least it was teeming with fish and other sea creatures that made some degree of fishing activities possible. Though it was impossible to get rich by relying on this alone, at the very least the new baron wouldn't starve to death. King Leon is indeed a considerate and generous man. Link then continued to examine the official documents with a contented heart when the idea of going back home suddenly popped up in his mind. This body that his soul inhabited was a younger son of the Viscount Hamilton Morani. He'd left home for more than a year now and had successfully entered a prestigious magic academy and had even been awarded the title of a hereditary baron. It was time for him to go home. He wasn't going back to show off his glorious achievements, of course, but only because he realized that there was still a duty that he must fulfill back home. There was no reason to worry about his father, he was a Viscount after all, who had children and grandchildren to look after him. The person Link was worried about was in fact his mother. Link's mother wasn't the Viscount's first wife, who had died after bearing the Viscount two sons. He then felt lonely so he married Link's mother, who bore him a daughter and another son. This youngest son was Link, of course, while the daughter was Link's own elder sister who had now come of age but because the Viscount could only afford to give her a small dowry, no suitable man had asked for her hand yet. The Viscount's first wife came from another powerful noble family. Her eldest son was the Viscount's heir apparent, so he would one day inherit all his land and title, while her second son was now a full-fledged knight with a bright future. Link's mother, on the other hand, had come from a minor clan with no name or fortune of her own. The Viscount's two older sons had no respect for her at all and had always tried to force her out of the Viscount's castle since the first day she married into this family. Link remembered how they finally succeeded in driving his mother out five years ago. She was ousted from the castle by his eldest brother and was now living in a small cottage in the countryside. His sister was allowed to remain in the castle as she could be used as a tool to solidify a political alliance by marrying her off to a suitable family. These were some of the rotten affairs going on within the Morani family. Link had no intention of interfering in it. He couldn't change the past, but he still had the ability to improve the present. He had the ability to support his mother now, so he planned to make the appropriate arrangements to enable her to come and live with him. Link just couldn't bear to let her live out the rest of her poor life alone and uncared for. It wasn't that Link was determined to help her out of any emotional attachment since he'd never actually met her, but only because it was the most righteous thing to do. The Hamilton estate was in the Pufferfish County about a hundred miles north of the Gervant Forest. It shouldn't take too much time to go there, thought Link. He then started to write a letter home, briefly summarizing his current situation and mentioning the date that they could expect him to be home. Once he was done he dropped it into the mailbox at the entrance of the inn. When he returned to his room, he could sense something different in the room, as if there was a foreign presence there. He scanned the room but didn't see anyone there. Then suddenly, he noticed something from the corner of his eyes, a black raven perched proudly on his reading table with its beady eyes staring intently at Link. I knew you'd come, said Link as he closed the door. When he turned back around, Eleanor had already transformed back into her human form. Is my gear ready? She asked as she picked up a tool of enchantment on the table. She noticed the debris left on the tool and could guess the answer to her question herself. I'm guessing it is, huh? Link nodded then handed over the flame blast bracelet to her. Eleanor's eyes widened the moment she had her eyes on the bracelet. She turned it over back and forth gently in her hands, visibly getting more and more impressed by Link's creation. She handled the bracelet very carefully as if afraid that she might break it. Don't worry, said Link with a laugh. I've made it to be sturdy enough. It won't break as long as you don't hit it with a hammer. Link's remarks went unnoticed as Eleanor continued to be deeply enchanted by the Phoenix bracelet. 
She tried wearing it on her wrist and found that it felt just right, it was neither too tight nor too loose, and it even felt smooth and luxurious as it brushed against her skin. It's marvelous! exclaimed Eleanor. She loved it the moment she set her eyes on it. She'd be more than willing to wear the bracelet all the time even if it didn't contain any magical power. Oh, that's right. I should check the spell in this bracelet too. Then, the more she examined the bracelet the more astonished she was at its superior quality. There's something different about this flame blast, remarked Eleanor. Is it the same kind that you used in that battle? Oh, but you didn't just improve its accuracy, you've incorporated such, such a sublime structure for this spell. She then turned her gaze away from the bracelet and stared at Link with wonder. Aren't you worried that I might learn your secret skills from this bracelet? She asked. This single bracelet would compensate her lack of direct combat skills. With it she would be able to cast Flame Blast in no time at all, she shuddered just from thinking about possessing such terrifying power. You can do whatever you want, replied Link with a shrug. I just have to do my best once I've set my mind to do something, otherwise I won't be able to go to sleep at night. He'd only incorporated two supreme magical skills in the bracelet, after all, of which the combined value was minuscule compared to that of the Scroll of Enlightenment. Besides, he wasn't planning on stopping his progress anytime soon. He would surely be learning countless more powerful spells than Flame Blast in the future. Flame Blast wasn't even the best weapon he had in his arsenal anyway, what had given him the crucial edge in battles were in fact his lightning-fast spellcasting and the aid from the gaming system. Eleanor thought differently, though. She kept admiring the exquisite bracelet and sighed. This quality far exceeds my expectations, she thought. It seems I've struck gold in this deal. She then handed the scroll of enlightenment over to Link. I've studied this scroll thoroughly, she said. I don't think I could glean any more knowledge from it than what I've already learned. I'm giving it to you in return for saving my life. Even without the exquisite bracelet, the debt of gratitude Eleanor owed Link for saving her the other day in Jade Street alone was great enough that she was willing to give up the scroll for him. But isn't this? Link was momentarily stupefied. Even though he had memorized every detail of the scroll before, so he possibly had no need for it but. The scroll was nevertheless invaluable because he could use it to look for the five remaining scrolls of enlightenment. When he thought of this point, Link immediately decided to accept Eleanor's gift. All right, said Link, I'll accept it. Thank you. Eleanor nodded her head, albeit not without a heavy heart. This scroll was her most treasured possession that had been with her for the last 30 years. She was slightly upset that she had to part with it after all these years. Still, it was too late to change her mind now, so she took a deep breath and held back her emotions. I've got something else to tell you, she then said. Do you remember the Dark Elf Swordswoman who managed to escape? Of course I do, replied Link, stunned by Eleanor's sudden question. Well, I've caught her, she said. Where is she? Asked Link enthusiastically. Leave Spring City and head back to the East Cove Magic Academy, she said. I will meet you on the way. Be careful not to let anyone follow you, the MI3 people are hot on her trail right now. Understood. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Chapter 146, Glyph of Soul, Part 2 Link took a carriage out of Hot Springs City to the outskirts. After paying the fare, he traveled on foot for a few miles before a black raven perched itself on his shoulders, it was Eleanor. Turn left at the next corner, the raven whispered. The path in front was a narrow, winding and dark road into the forest. Link was slightly hesitant. After all, he was not very familiar with this woman. If he were to go into such a remote place with her, he risked walking right into a trap. However, he quickly dismissed this thought as preposterous. He rationalized that there was no need to go to such lengths if she truly wanted to kill him. She could have easily done so on Jade Street when he was preoccupied with the three dark elves. Furthermore, she wouldn't have given him access to the Scroll of Enlightenment. Link then walked towards the alley in confident strides. Eleanor was slightly puzzled. Aren't you afraid that I will harm you? Link smiled and said, you specialize in secret magic. 
If you had wanted to harm me, I would probably already be dead. Secret spells were not built for direct combat. However, they were extremely lethal when used in sneak attacks. Many times, the victim would not even realize how they died. This was true even for magicians. Eleanor simply laughed. After round 600 feet, they entered the deepest part of the forest. The overgrowth was getting thicker by the moment, devouring the path they were on. Are we there yet? Link asked. We are still five miles away. I presume you would have learned some traveling spells by now. Eleanor spoke with a hint of disapproval in her voice. How could a magician like Link travel simply by walking? Link only knew one such spell. He began to summon his wind Fenrir. His speed increased exponentially after riding his summon. In two minutes, they reached a stream in the middle of the forest. There is a hunter's hut straight ahead. It's right there, do you see it? Eleanor asked. It was a small, wooden hut that was built to offer passing hunters refuge for the night. The roof was full of algae and the wooden doors were filled with decaying holes. When they reached the front of the wooden hut, Eleanor jumped down from Link's shoulders and turned into her human form. As Link entered the room behind Eleanor, he saw a huge bed in the room. A female dark elf could be seen restrained on pieces of rotten beast hide infested with worms. The rope used to restrain her seemed to be glowing slightly, probably enchanted with some sort of sealing spell. Under the effect of this magical rope, the dark elf was unable to move. When she heard movements coming from the door, she immediately turned and threw a deathly stare in that direction with her pair of crimson eyes. However, this was only directed at Eleanor. When she saw Link, her expression changed to one that was shocked and dumbfounded, her eyes involuntarily showing signs of retreat. The battle at Jade Street against Link had completely destroyed her pride. Eleanor sat down on a broken stool and stared pitifully at the dark elf on the bed. She then began her introduction, I have already done my research. The three dark elves that day were Philidia, a magician, Anos, an assassin, and lastly, this woman. She is Alina, a level, five assassin and apparently a famous figure in the Prowling Kingdom. She also has a prominent background, being the daughter of King Norrigan. Many people call her the Constellation Assassin. Link was appalled. He thought, it's no wonder that they were strong. They were the Three Musketeers. In the first two versions of the game, the three of them wreaked great havoc on the human race. The eventual collapse of the Norton Kingdom could definitely be traced back to their actions. To think that the Three Musketeers would suffer such a fate in this timeline. Two of them were already dead while the other was now a captive under his hands. He then saw a sword lying on top of a small table. If this person was indeed Alina, this sword would be the infamous weapon, the Sword of Shattered Stars. He unsheathed the sword and a blast of cold air immediately engulfed the atmosphere. The sword shone brightly even under the dim sunlight as the entire sword body was made of thorium. Link carefully studied the sword and gasped. How extravagant, this is a fine piece of work. Don't touch it with your dirty human hands. Alina shouted in rage. She said this sentence in human language. Link pretended not to hear her and brandished the sword right in front of her. He then spun around and asked Eleanor, I can probably guess the motive of their mission. It was to assassinate Prince Philip and sow discord between the human race and the High Elves. Am I right? Eleanor nodded. Of course. Their plan was almost flawless. It is a shame that they met a monster like you. Did you manage to get any other information? Link asked. Eleanor simply smiled and said, I did, but you might not like the method I used to get this information. You are referring to the soul search spell I suppose. I don't really dislike it as long as it is useful, Link laughed. While the soul search spell indeed belonged to the realm of dark magic, it was still a useful spell. In fact, he even learned it while he was playing the game. Although he would not voluntarily learn the spell in this timeline, he definitely would not dismiss its effectiveness either. Eleanor looked at Link carefully and found no trace of disgust or disapproval on his face. She was puzzled. This is a forbidden spell. Shouldn't you be horrified and accuse me of being a dark witch? 
The sacred land of light had an irrational fear of dark magic and that was exactly the reason Eleanor was alone all these years. Her life was basically a game of hide and seek with ordinary humans. Whenever she felt exposed after staying in a location for too long, she would immediately relocate to ensure her safety. Even her mage tower was instantly mobile. Stop testing the waters. Truthfully, I am not a fan of such spells and thus would not attempt to learn them. However, I have no right to ask others to do the same. I am sure the vengeful souls on Jade Street would have no qualms about you using such spells on the Dark Elves. There is then no reason for me to oppose the use of such spells. Link was open to the discussion of dark magic. After all, every successful person in the world would have some dirt under their nails. If Link were to follow the rules strictly, he would never have been able to defeat the dark forces. He then continued, what did you find? All right then. You are the weirdest person I've ever met. But I guess it is for the best. If you don't mind, take a look at this. Eleanor passed him a scroll. The scroll looked extremely ordinary. After opening it, Link realized that the scroll was filled with characters from the Dark Elf language. The arrangement of the characters was interesting as well, lining up in a specific formation that seemed to dictate their relationship with one another. Link came to an understanding after a few looks. The original copy of the Dark Elf's secret code? That is what I think. Eleanor shrugged her shoulders, before speaking in a regretful tone, it is unfortunate that we did not come across any secret messages. This thing is too valuable. Alina was completely startled. She was clear of the consequences if the secret code fell into the hands of the human race. Careful and intelligent use of the secret code would be a devastating blow to the death hand and even might even destroy the entire prowling kingdom. Her instinct was to immediately destroy the scroll. However, her strength was completely restrained and all she could do was cast worried glances in Link's direction. Link smiled and said, we don't have any secret messages. However, MI3 would have a lot of them. We can just pass this to them. He carefully studied the secret code and memorized the all the contents of the scroll. He did actually have a secret message scroll with him and could decipher it with the help of this treasure. However, there was no need for Eleanor to know about this. The secret code was the most valuable loot in this mission. Link then turned his attention towards the constellation's assassin, thinking of how to dispose of the Dark Elf. Eleanor chuckled, are you hesitant to kill such a beautiful young girl? Alina indeed had an exquisite face and a voluptuous body. She would be considered a rare beauty even by human standards. However, that was all a facade. Her true form was a ruthless and crazy assassin, as evidenced by the destructive ambush in Jade Street. At the same time, she was an extremely talented dark elf assassin. He could not let such a strong opponent live. Should I kill her directly? Or should I remove her combat powers instead and turn her into a disgrace of the Dark Elves? After some thought, Link raised the Sword of Shattered Stars and placed it over Alina's chest. He would end it once and for all. Alina could see the shadows of death looming precariously over her. She stared at Link furiously and said, Link, you will suffer the endless pursuit of the Death Hand the moment I die. I will be waiting for your soul in hell. Link simply laughed, I guess you will have to be very patient. He gently pushed the sword down and the sharp blade effortlessly pierced through Alina's heart, ending her life. Eleanor then spoke in a regretful tone, to think that a princess would die in such a rundown place. If we had given her to MI3, she would have fetched a huge price. She has seen too much. If she was handed over to MI3, you would also be in danger. Link had considered that option before killing Alina. However, this would not only reveal Eleanor's connection with dark magic, he would also be embroiled in the dark magic mess. The risks definitely outweighed the benefits. Of course, Link was not about to leave without getting any rewards. The moment Alina breathed her last, a message appeared in his vision. Mission, rescue second step, completed. Player receives one glyph of soul. Glyph of soul. Level, 5. Effect, player can choose to store a spell level, 5 and below in the glyph of soul. This will greatly reduce the time needed to construct the magic structure. 
this will not reduce the strength of the spell. Note, this is perfect for magicians who want a fast spellcasting speed. Link was elated, this is too good to be true. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Chapter 147, The Flaming Hand Part 1 Alina's lifeless body was set on fire and burned to ashes. Link then spread the ashes across the surface of the stream in the middle of the forest and let her remains flow away with the course of the water. And that was the end of the three musketeers of the Silver Moon. Her sword was made of solid gold and the magic seal on it contained a lot of thorium, so Link used his enchantment skill to isolate these elements and divide them equally between Eleanor and himself. From there, Link now had ten pounds of gold and another ounce of thorium, which in total was worth the eye-watering amount of twenty thousand gold coins. Once everything was settled, Link and Eleanor then parted ways at King's Lane near the Gervin Forest. I've repaid my debt to you for saving my life with the Scroll of Enlightenment. I've even helped you in deciphering the code in the original scroll and found Alina. Don't you think you should show me a bit more gratitude? Link thought she had a point there. He never expected to have gained so much by acquainting himself with a person he had assumed to be evil. The Scroll of Enlightenment, the Glyph of Soul, the Secret Code Document. Link had acquired all this with Eleanor's help and they were all extremely useful items. His skills in enchantment were something he was proud of the most right now, so he made Eleanor an offer. I'll make you another magic gear then, he said. Good, replied Eleanor. My left arm feels a bit empty at the moment. I think another bracelet there would be nice, but I don't feel like forking out the gold coins for the price of the materials. All right, I got it, said Link. I'll start working on it the moment I get back to the academy. Write to me when you want to get it, and I'll send it to you. It's a deal, said Eleanor. Make sure this new bracelet of mine is as exquisite as my phoenix bracelet, or I won't forgive you for it. She caressed the beloved flame blast bracelet on her wrist lovingly as she spoke, although she had now renamed it as her phoenix bracelet. I will try my best, said Link with a purse smile. They then waved goodbye to each other and Link turned down King's Lane. Eleanor stood in the forest watching Link's figure disappear gradually. Link, my name is Eleanor! She shouted when Link was almost out of sight. Link didn't turn back around but waved his hand to indicate that he'd heard her. He walked on until finally his figure was blocked behind a tree and disappeared completely. Eleanor sighed softly as she turned around and headed into the depths of the Gervin Forest. Now I'm alone again, she thought. Meanwhile, Link walked along King's Lane alone. He could encounter someone any time on the road so he didn't summon the wind Fenrir to avoid alarming a passerby, so he continued to walk all the way back. After about ten minutes of walking, an oxcart came up behind him. He gave the peasant driving the oxcart a silver coin and hopped on it. The oxcart moved sluggishly, so he only reached the academy late in the afternoon. It was winter at the time and the weather hadn't been so good on that day as well. There were even some snowflakes drifting in the wind. Once he stepped down from the oxcart, Link gathered his sleeves and pulled up the hood of his robe and entered the academy. It had been such a cold day, in fact, even Vincent was absent from his usual spot in the garden. He had kept himself warm inside the cottage instead. When he heard someone's footsteps at the gates, he opened the window to take a look outside. Once he discovered it was someone wearing the magician's robe of the East Cove Magic Academy he decided there was no threat to be found and closed the window. As he treaded the snow-covered path in the chilly wind on his way back to his mage tower, Link suddenly thought of his mother again. Her name was Lilith. She was forty years old this year, and she was a woman so kind and gentle that one might think she was weak. Link wondered how she was getting along now in that small cottage in the countryside. There were always shortages of all kinds in that cottage, thought Link. I wonder if she had enough coal and firewood to protect her from this cold. How are the servants treating her? Does she even have enough clothes or food to survive the season? Although she was just the mother of this body that his soul inhabited and was not his actual blood relation at all, the memories of her still remained in his mind, making it hard for him to bear the thoughts that she might be suffering a hard life right now. I've refused the offers from the dean and the king to join the army, so there shouldn't be any reason blocking me from visiting her. Pufferfish County isn't so far away from here, anyway. 
I'd better pay her a visit. As he came to a decision Link's footsteps began to quicken. He reached the mage tower right when Herrera was giving a lecture to the apprentices in the hall on the first floor. When she saw Link, she nodded at him and continued her lecture. Link took a seat in the hall and went on to study a magic textbook there. Half an hour later, Herrera's lecture was over. She then walked over to Link. Is everything in the capital city settled? She asked. Yes, answered Link. I've gotten hold of some things that I must inform you of, but I can't do it here. Link was using the softest voice possible to prevent anyone from overhearing him. He was talking about the secret code document that Eleanor had given him. He knew that the authorities would find it very useful. Let's go to the top floor, Herrera said. Once they reached the top floor, Link took out the cipher scroll and the secret code document, although the secret code document wasn't the one Eleanor gave him, but was a copy that he made on the ox cart. He did this to protect Eleanor's existence from the authorities. Herrera was oblivious to this small detail. She examined the scrolls for a while and discovered that they were indeed very important documents. Where did you get these? She asked, full of shock. One of my followers accidentally discovered this cipher scroll at the cliff of Howling Winds, explained Link. While the secret code document was given to me by the black-dressed woman, it was too late to conceal Eleanor's existence, but he decided that he wouldn't reveal the friendship between them just yet. Black-dressed woman? Asked Herrera, more and more confused now. Do you mean that mysterious magician? Yes, answered Link. She was at Jade Street when the flame blast explosion happened and barely managed to escape death because of it. I guess she gave this to me because she believed that I could somehow defeat the dark elves who had almost killed her. It wasn't the whole truth, but Link sounded convincing when he uttered it because he believed it was a necessary lie and his conscience was clear. As expected, Herrera believed him. She put the cipher scroll and the secret code document side by side and began to compare them. She did this for a few minutes before her eyebrows furrowed and she turned her gaze up to Link. It says here, she began with a grave tone, that the Dark Elves are planning something called the Black Moon Conspiracy, and they mentioned a Dark Elf called Felidia. But there was no mention of what the plan was about and who was going to be involved. Link hadn't found the right time and place to translate the codes himself, so he started doing so now. He discovered that the information on the cipher scroll was short and simple. Apart from the words Black Moon Conspiracy and the name of the now dead Felidia, the only other key information on the scroll was a date, April 4th. It was now January 3rd, about three and a half months away from the date mentioned. Although it wasn't stated explicitly on the scroll, it was very likely that the date was to be the operation date for the Black Moon Conspiracy. Nevertheless, a date was far from enough information. They still had no idea what the Black Moon Conspiracy was or which part of the Norton Kingdom would be targeted. We need more information, said Herrera. She suspected that something terrible was going to happen, something that would eclipse the tragedy that happened on Jade Street recently. Tudor, don't you think we should hand these documents over to the MI3? Suggested Link. They've always dealt with the Dark Elves in the Death Hand, perhaps this would provide them with vital information. Link realized that the course of history had deviated from the original version in the game more and more now that he could no longer predict the future. There had never been such a thing as the Black Moon Conspiracy in the game so Link guessed that it might concern the East Cove Magic Academy, although he decided to keep quiet about it for now as it was only a speculation. You're right, agreed Herrera after thinking it over for a few moments. We should hand it over to MI3. Herrera then gathered the scrolls in her hands and was ready to leave. We are in a dire situation. I must report this to the dean right away. Only he has enough power and authority to take the right steps quickly. Link nodded in agreement. The dean's help would be crucial right now. Tudor, said Link before Herrera left. In five days, it'll be the Winter Vale Festival. I'd like to visit my family and spend half a month with them. I'll be on my way soon. The Winter Vale Festival was the most important festival in the Fireman calendar. It was the occasion when everyone who had ventured out of their hometown would journey back for a reunion with their families. Herrera was slightly taken aback by the sudden change of topic, but eventually she nodded. Be careful on the road, she said. And don't forget to study and practice. 
Yes, tutor, answered Link. Link then went back to his room and packed his luggage. There wasn't much packing to do as he didn't have much to bring, plus he could just put everything inside his storage pendant. A few minutes later, he was done and ready to go, so he bid farewell to Iliard and arranged some studying plans for his disciple Riley. He left the academy early morning the next day, heading north to the Pufferfish County. It was still peaceful and quiet in the Gervant Forest when he was traveling through it along the King's Lane. But unbeknownst to Link, ten miles away three dark elves in disguise were entering Spring City. Of the three, one was a magician, one was an assassin and the other was a warrior. All of them were level five. They were the retainers of the Norrigan Familia who had come down south in the Norton Kingdom to rescue the clan leader's beloved daughter, the swordswoman Alina. Link was oblivious to all this as he was engrossed in an advanced magic textbook in the carriage. It was titled The Flaming Hand and its content was devoted to the eponymous spell. The spell caught his attention because even though the level 5 glyph of the soul would allow him to engrave any spell that was lower than level 5, it would be a big waste to do so. The only way to make use of such a priceless reward from the gaming system was to engrave a powerful level 5 spell on his soul with it. The Flaming Hand was a level 5 spell with a frightening power. Apart from that, when mastered the spellcaster would be able to accurately control this spell to cause devastating effects. It was indeed a terrifying weapon when used in a battle. Naturally though, because of its powerful affects, the rate of mana consumption was abnormally high as well. It was unlike any other spell Link had mastered so far in the sense that it consumed mana continuously, not just at the moment of casting like the rest. When there was no opponent present, the spell would consume 10 mana points per second to sustain it. When facing an opponent, the rate of mana consumption would increase the higher the opponent's level was. For example, when fighting against a level 5 opponent, the spell could consume as high as 100 mana points per second. If the opponent was a level 6 magician though, then the spell would be virtually useless since the mana consumption rate would be so high that the opponent would be able to defeat you in one move. Link couldn't afford this rate of mana consumption in the past, but he now had 200 Omni points and a 1900 maximum mana limit. It was a mystery to Link, but ever since receiving Herrera's angelic blessings, his mana had recovered rapidly, especially when he basked in the sunlight. In slightly more than a month, his maximum mana limit had increased from 1800 to 1900 points. Link thought this must be the side effects of receiving the blessings from an angel of light. Since his mana wouldn't be a limitation now, he naturally wanted to begin mastering the extraordinary spell immediately. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Chapter 148, The Flaming Hand Part 2 In the middle of the night. Hot Spring City, the magician's district, central plaza ruins. It had been a week since the day of the tragedy. The dead bodies and rubble had already been properly disposed of. A variety of tools and materials could be seen laying on the ground around the destroyed architectures. The city had begun recovering from the incident and was in the midst of reconstruction. However, the huge crater near the fountain at the center of the plaza was still present. The fragments of charred flesh stuck in between the cracks on the ground and the two visible trails of Link's flame blast spell served as a stark reminder of the cruelty of the attack. A shadow draped in a large cloak emerged from a broken hut. He then crouched down and carefully observed the rubble and trails on the ground. After a moment, the shadow spoke. These stones have a blackened surface and show signs of melting. They seem to spread out in a conical formation. This person had cast a single directional fire elemental spell, at least level 4 in strength. Another figure behind him replied. It does not matter what method he used. He will definitely be dead. Did you find any traces of the princess? No need to rush, the shadow said before materializing a wand in his hands. A moment after he raised his wand, the tip of the wand was enveloped in a light purple glimmer which was almost invisible to the naked eye. The light then diffused over the plaza ruins. After twenty seconds, a silver glow appeared on top of a hut at the corner of the plaza. It's the silver moon blood! It's from the princess, the shadow quickly said. The Silver Moon Blood was commonly known as the Holy Demon Blood. It was a unique trait of the three largest familias in the Prowling Kingdom. The blood contained certain special magic properties that made it detectable by a specific spell. 
The moment he spoke, two figures rushed out from behind and traveled hastily towards the hut. These three people were the masters of the Norrigan Familia. Their mission was to rescue Princess Alina from the clutches of the human race. Of the two figures who rushed out, one of them was equipped with two long swords. He was a warrior and was traveling at a slow pace. On the other hand, his comrade was outrageously fast and stealthy, much like a cloud of smoke. The moment the magician finished his speech, he was already at the hut marked by the silver moon blood. He was an assassin that specialized in tracking. He was revered as a battle hound. He squatted down and observed the blood carefully. Parson Norisa, this is the princess blood. The blood stain was oval in shape and unevenly dispersed. This meant that the princess was traveling at a fast speed at that moment. It seemed like she headed west. He spoke while following the trail of blood, soon arriving at the alley Alina was in the previous day. The magician and warrior followed closely behind him. Traces of Alina became more obvious and voluminous as they entered the alley. Blood stains, slightly sunken footprints, and the dent in the walls caused by a heavy landing. Although a week had passed and such traces were almost undetectable to ordinary humans, it was easily captured by the assassin. The trio traced these trails through half the city until they reached the most western Prince Bill area. Prince Bill area was the affluent district of Hot Springs City. It housed many beautiful parks decorated with towering trees and small round shrubs regularly trimmed. The trio lost all clues in one of these parks. All of the traces are gone. This is strange, the princess seems to have disappeared into thin air. The assassin was perplexed. The magician who had kept silent all these while spoke. No, the situation is weird. I feel the remnant magic fluctuations of a powerful magician. Dark elves had a natural talent for night vision. The blanket of darkness and silence over the park had in fact heightened magician Parson's senses, allowing him to detect even the faintest of magic fluctuations. He walked around the park in a circle before stopping behind a piece of wood. He had actually already felt this mysterious aura at the plaza ruins. However, due to the explosions of several flame blast spells and the bustle of the city in the morning, the aura was extremely disorienting. On the other hand, the situation in the park was different. There was only one clear magic aura around the area, much like a flaming torch in the darkness. The magic aura here is the most intense. Hedel, come and take a look. Hedel was the name of the assassin. He walked towards the wood and circled around it before suddenly reaching out his hand, making a grabbing action. When he retracted his hand, he was holding a strand of black hair. It's a woman's hair. From the glow and texture, it feels like a twenty-year-old girl. Heddle spoke. Magician Parsons, on the other hand, felt something was amiss. He took another glance before raising his staff to cast a detection spell on the hair. Under the effect of the spell, the hair immediately exuded a faint white glow. This glow was similar to a mist slowly being released from the strand of hair. As the mist dissipated into the hair, the strand of hair seemed to lose its luster. This is not a normal human girl. She is a secret magic magician that is way older than 20 years old. If I am not wrong, her target is the princess. He then looked around before pointing at the ground 15 feet away from the wood. These should be her footprints. Try to see if you can locate her. All right. Heddle began to wander around the area, sometimes even laying on the ground for closer observation. After around five minutes, he spoke. I have found it. This way. The two of them once again followed behind. The trio went all the way out of Hot Spring City. Several times, Hedda lost all clues of the princess, but with the help of Magician Parson's keen senses, they would quickly get back on track. After a moment, they stared at each other. The princess had been held captive by a secret magician and was brought out of the capital. The situation is grave. Magician Parsons frowned. He knew that secret magicians were also usually known as dark magicians. Although the dark elves had a higher tolerance for black magic than the human race, they also had a deeper understanding about the cruelty and unpredictability of such magic. If the princess was subjected to torture under such magic, she would likely lose all rationality even if she was not dead. Don't think too much. Our mission is simply to save the princess. There are still clues. The warrior Norisa spoke. 
That's right. Hedel nodded and rushed forward. It could be inferred from the traces that the secret magician stuffed the princess onto a carriage before bringing her out of the city, heading west along King's Lane. After an hour of tracking the clear trails of the carriage, Hedel spoke. They alighted from the carriage. The princess' footprints can be seen for a while before disappearing. Parsons then spoke. That is normal. The secret magician is a female and probably does not have much physical strength. She should have cast a levitation spell. Her footprints alone will suffice. Hedel squinted his eyes and traveled along the forest alleyway. After a while, he gasped. Parsons, what kind of beast is this? It is humongous. The forest pathways were getting more uneven and difficult to maneuver around. The appearance of a giant beast's footprint was thus a shock to Hedel. The situation seemed to be more complex than he imagined. Parsons crouched down and carefully observed the footprints. After a few minutes, he spoke. These are the footprints of a summon called Wind Fenrir. There is a new source of magic aura here. In fact, this is the second time this aura appeared. The first time was in Hot Springs City when we were investigating the plaza ruins. He should be the person who released the single directional level 4 fire elemental spell. Could it be that he is an ally of the secret magician? Warrior Norisa immediately made the connection. Very likely. Parsons had a serious expression on his face. When they were collecting information in Hot Spring City, they had a quick overview of the events that unfolded on Jade Street. A human magician seemed to have defeated the princess. To think that the magician would once again appear on the princess trails outside of Hot Springs City together with the secret magician. This would only mean that the princess managed to make her escape, but eventually became his captive. The princess was probably, Parsons did not want to continue down this train of thought. His two other comrades also had a sunken expression on their faces. The clear footprints from the wind Fenrir made the tracking process a lot easier. The trio reached a small hut beside a stream after half an hour. The moment they stepped in front of the hut, Magician Parsons had a livid expression. He felt the aura of death. He kept silent and entered the hut. The first thing that caught his attention the moment he entered was the huge blood stain on the bed. He cast a detection spell and the blood stain immediately emitted a silver hue. It was the princess blood. Assassin Heddle similarly found many clues. He exited the hut and traced the trails all the way to the stream, where he came to a conclusion on Alina's outcome. She was killed. Her body was burned to ashes and then scattered into the running stream. Heddle spoke calmly, though his pair of dark red eyes was already burning with a faint glimmer of battle aura. Is it possible to track the whereabouts of both the magicians? Norisa held his sword tightly. Since the princess was already killed, they would have to avenge her in some way. Parsons did not reply immediately. Instead, he circled the hut three times before concluding. The secret magician was extremely careful. She erased all clues that could allow us to trace her whereabouts. However, the young magician will not be able to escape. He is a magician from the East Cove Higher Magic Academy called Link. He is quite a famous person in this area. Let's go pay him a visit. I will gouge his heart out right there. Heddle smiled cruelly. Parsons shook his head. No, we should bring him back to the north and present him to the king. The king will show him what exactly is cruelty. Yes, Parsons is right. We cannot let this magician die so easily. Norisa gritted his teeth. This is a seven English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Chapter 149, The Flaming Hand, Part 3 On King's Lane Link was completely unaware that he was being watched. He had now reached the outskirts of the Pufferfish County, the estate of his father, the Viscount Hamilton Morani. In front of him was the Clearwater River, which was a river of about 300 feet wide where various types of ships frequently sailed. After traveling along the King's Lane for a few hours, Link was now approaching a great bridge. The bridge was called the Great Hamilton Bridge. It was built by the Viscount, and had always been a source of pride for him. The toll tax collected from the ships that sailed past this bridge on Clearwater River was about 500 gold coins per year, and it was the main source of income for the Morani family. It could be said that this bridge had provided the whole of the Morani family with all their necessities and luxuries. 
Link's carriage was now on the Great Hamilton Bridge. He looked out into the distance and saw a castle on the hillside. This was the Morani Castle where Link's physical body had spent his first fifteen years. It's been two years now, thought Link. I wonder if my eldest brother is still as bossy as before. Is my second brother's lust for women constrained now by any measure? I hope my sister didn't get bullied much. Link's elder sister was his only full sibling, so they were very close with each other when he was still living in the castle. When he was little, his sister was always there to protect him and take care of him, but as he got older Link turned into a quiet and reserved young man while his sister became more and more worried about her own future, so they weren't as close as they used to be now. Link didn't dwell on these thoughts about his family for long, though. Soon enough his attention was focused back on the magic textbook in his hands. The Pufferfish County was about a hundred miles away from the East Cove Magic Academy. He started the journey yesterday morning and stayed at an inn by the road for a night. It was now the evening of the second day. Link had been continuously studying the level 5 spell, the Flaming Hand. By now, every minute detail of the spell's structure had been firmly planted in his memory. He never practiced it in the elemental pool though, so Link didn't dare to use it indiscriminately yet. This was a level 5 fire element spell. Not only did it contain a frightening amount of power, the fire elements that made up the spell were also notoriously difficult to control. This meant that the slightest mistakes he made might result in a cataclysmic explosion. This is a powerful spell that needs to be controlled very precisely, Link pondered. It would make a good weapon to attack opponents with and an excellent defensive spell. Maybe I should engrave this spell on my soul with the Glyph of Soul. Once the spell was engraved on his soul with the Glyph of Soul, he could then cast the spell without constructing the spell structure in his mind. All he had to do was trigger his mana and wait for the elements to converge and condense, and the spell would take form perfectly every time. How simple would that be? But this is just a regular version of the spell, thought Link. If I'm going to engrave a spell with the Glyph of Soul, I'd better modify it with some supreme magical skills first to make the best of it. With his fast thinking speed, Link managed to study the flaming hand from cover to cover in a single day. This meant that he had a whole day left to ponder on how to improve the spell with supreme magical skills, of which he now had some rough ideas. The inspiration for these ideas came once again from the space-time thesis that he had been working on. At present, Link had developed his thesis to a point where he had hit upon the profound layer of the truth fabric. It had yielded him with unexpected insights that led to his extraordinary innovations which had helped in gradually enhancing his strength and power. It was no exaggeration to say that this thesis had become a treasure trove for Link where he could pick out invaluable pieces of knowledge from it every once in a while. Too bad there isn't any elemental pool here so I can't test the spell yet. Link was itching to try out the spell now, but he knew that it was a taboo thing among magicians to test out new spells in public. He wasn't planning on becoming a laughing stock among the magicians just because of some slight mistakes he might make in trying out a new spell. Just as he was about to put down the textbook The Flaming Hand and was going to turn his attention to Bryant's scroll of enlightenment, a notification suddenly appeared on the interface. Link found the notification slightly odd. It was one that he'd never seen before. Would you like to simulate spellcasting? Simulate spellcasting? Link was surprised. Explain to me what it is. The gaming system can assist the player by simulating the process of spellcasting in the realm of consciousness. This way the player can verify the feasibility and effectiveness of a spell. You can do that too? Asked Link, bewildered. Why didn't you tell me earlier? Link had to wait for his turn to use the elemental pool to learn the spell flame blast. Had the gaming system told him about such a magnificent feature that he could take advantage of, it would have saved him so much time. Player's soul strength was not strong enough in the past. The simulation might cause some damage to the player's soul. Is it strong enough now, then? Link asked. When did it get stronger? Why didn't I notice it? When you confronted the necromancer's shade, you surpassed your own limit. Then when you received the blessings of the angel of light, there was an ascension in the strength of your soul. Link understood it now. He had broken through his own limits as he was fighting against the undead, that was why he had such a splitting headache then. Then Herrera had sacrificed parts of her own soul to help heal his soul, which made him recover not only to his previous strength, 
but made it even stronger than before. Seeing that it would take more than an hour to arrive at the Morani Castle, Link estimated that he would have enough time to master one spell in the meantime. Start spell casting simulation now, he instructed the gaming system. As soon as the words came out of his mouth, the spell structure of the flaming hand appeared right in front of him. This was a level 5 spell, so its spell structure was complex and intricate, much more than that of the level 4 flame blast. The flaming hand was another spell that was based on runic light wheels. It contained 5 light wheels and there were more than 100 runes on each wheel. If he used the same spell casting technique as the one shown in the simulation earlier, Link estimated that he would spend 4 seconds on spell casting even when he had already mastered it. In real battles, taking 4 seconds to cast a spell was enough to create an opening for an assassin or a warrior to kill him more than 10 times. Then, Link saw clouds of red gas flowing from all directions into the bright red frame of spell structure, creating a giant flaming hand of which each finger was thicker than an elephant's leg. The hand was glowing white and there were spirals of red-hot flame surrounding it while its surface was roiling with heat waves. By the looks of it, if the hand was holding a man inside its palm, it could completely vaporize the man in less than a second. In the field of vision, Link saw a red-colored atmosphere flowing in from all sides into this red magic structure, forming a large flame giant with a finger two times larger than the elephant's leg. The color of the hand was incandescent and surrounded by a red fire. The flame, on the outside, was a billowing heat wave. It's not bad, but it's just a regular version, said Link in his own realm of consciousness. I'll modify it. As soon as he had the idea, the flaming hand in front of him disappeared and turned into its basic spell structure. Link then began to modify it based on the ideas that he had when observing the regular version earlier. He had been playing with the ideas of ways to modify the spell a dozen times in his head, so he took less than five minutes before a completely new spell structure was created. After checking it one last time and confirming that there were no defects, Link said, Simulate spell casting. The spell structure began to oscillate, and the red flames began to pour in. Soon afterwards, the flaming hand began to take shape and was about to come into its perfect from when suddenly there was a flash of light and the flaming hand scattered and collapsed. Simulated casting failed. The new structure was flawed. Link was not discouraged, though. He knew that it would take more than one trial to succeed. Can you repeat the process? Asked Link. And make it slower, too? Yes. And so, Link once again observed the whole process when the flaming hand collapsed. The speed was slowed down by five times so Link could very clearly see the whole process unfold and identify where it had gone wrong. Link finally spotted all the flaws after a few seconds. He pondered on a solution for about three minutes, then started to make slight alterations. This time, he spent about ten minutes on it. After making sure that everything was in place, he once again said to the gaming system, Simulate spell casting. The red gas flowed into the spell structure once again, but this time no accidents happened. The giant hand appeared, although its appearance slightly differed from the regular version. Its surface was still an incandescent white, but it was glowing very dimly, and the roiling waves around it were now controlled. The barrier between the flaming hand and the air around it was now clear-cut. Additionally, there was a transparent force field around the giant hand. This force field wrapped around each finger of the flaming hand. Under the influence of the fire elements on the force field, red rings of fire appeared around these fingers. The texture of this novel flaming hand was similar to that of Link's glass orbs. The reason being that both spells condensed all of their fire elements tightly inside their cores. Splendid, Link thought. Now I can completely control the flame and direct it to explode at the exact time that I wish it to. There are still some flaws here, though. The control of the flame's energy is still imperfect, but I can change that. Link liked spells that he could control which was why he had developed the flame blasts with high target accuracy and the glass orb with almost all of it fire elements constrained inside the orb. Right now, he wished to create a modified version of the flaming hand of which he could completely tweak its surface temperature to his desire. After the completion of its basic structure, he now began to make the final improvements to the spell. It took him more than half an hour this time. After modifying it five times, Link was finally content. Though half an hour might seem like a brief period of time, 
Link had actually spent more time because he was in the realm of his own consciousness. Because magicians usually possess fast thinking speed, one second in the real world was like a hundred seconds in their realm of consciousness. Link, on the other hand, had such a lightning fast thinking speed that one second in the real world could be as long as 200 seconds in his realm of consciousness. Combined with the boost he received from the gaming system, that was how he managed to modify a spell in less than an hour. No, said Link. Imprint this spell onto the Glyph of Soul. Are you sure? Yes. As soon as he made the reply Link felt as if something was slamming against his head. He could almost hear a clanging sound in his head, as if someone was hitting on a big brass bell. He had a throbbing headache when he finally regained consciousness. Nevertheless, the flaming hand structure had been clearly imprinted in his mind and he could recall it with all its minute details in no time at all. He had a feeling that as long as he triggered his mana he could construct the structure of this level 5 spell instantaneously. Then, a notification popped up on the interface. Player acquired a new soul spell. Please name the spell. Call it, the Vulcan's Hand, replied Link. He had wanted to call it the Buddha's Palm but he thought it sounded too grandiose and arrogant to name a spell he created himself something like that. Player successfully created a new level 5 spell, the Vulcan's Hand. Player receives 10 Omni Points and now has 210 Omni Points in total. Link took a quick glance at the notification then made it disappear. He rubbed his throbbing temple and closed his eyes to rest for a while. About ten minutes later the carriage gradually slowed down and came to a stop. Mr. Link, said the coachman, we're at the castle gate now. Link opened his eyes and peered out of the carriage window and discovered that he was now at the Hamilton family's castle gate. By now the guards on the castle wall had noticed the carriage approaching the moat, though they made no move to lower the bridge. Who goes there? shouted one of the guards. Report the name of the gentleman in the carriage. Tell them it's Link Morani, said Link to the coachman, who then shouted the reply. The guards on the castle wall were taken aback by the name given by the coachman. They knew that the Viscount's third son had left the castle to study magic a long time ago, and were surprised at his sudden appearance now. Why did the young master come back so suddenly? Did he hear that the old Viscount was sick in his bed and rushed back to make sure he got his share of the inheritance? This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to Advent of the Archmage. Chapter 150 The Flaming Hand Part 4 The Morony Castle was located at the highest point in Puffer County. As long as one was standing in an open space with an unobstructed view, they could see the castle clearly. It was 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Three dark elves carefully disguised as humans were traveling on horses along Hamilton Bridge. As they lifted their heads, they got a clear view of the castle. The three of them were powerful and had excellent vision. Not only did they get a clear view of the castle, they also saw a turquoise carriage traveling up the hill towards the castle. Look, it's a carriage from the East Cove Higher Magic Academy. The person inside must be Link. Heddle spoke. They rushed here the moment they heard that Link was returning back home. The sight of a carriage bearing the Academy's crest confirmed their suspicion. Quick, we'll go catch him now. Norisa gripped his sword tightly. There is no hurry, Magician Parson said as he looked at the distant carriage and castle. This is his family castle where his loved ones reside. We have to deliver the greatest pain to him to avenge the princess. We will wait till it's dusk before we sneak into the castle and kill his family members right in front of his eyes. Then we will burn down his family castle and destroy everything he ever owned. Fantastic! Heddle smacked his lips in satisfaction. The Dark Elves were blessed children of the night. As an assassin, he was thus the reaper when dusk fell. Link's carriage moved towards the castle at a steady pace. While the Morani family was not well known, the respective heads of the family had been lords for the past 300 years. There was a lot of thought put into the construction of the castle over all these years. The perimeter of the castle was surrounded by a 15-foot deep trench. As it was situated on higher ground, there was no water in the trench. Instead, the trench was deliberately filled with wooden spikes. The castle walls were made of a hardy material called star stone to defend against external attacks. The wall with the suspension bridge was further reinforced with magic runes. 
Link could tell in one look that those were anti-magic runes and sturdy runes. After entering the castle gate, one would be greeted by a plaza filled with weapons such as crossbows, catapults, and other instrumentals in castle defense. The plaza was surrounded by another layer of tall walls and lead to the second castle gate. If an enemy were to break through the first layer of defense, they would be trapped within the plaza and greeted by a deadly rain of arrows. There would be no escape. As Link continued to observe the castle, he felt that the castle was simply a war fortress. If it was stocked with an adequate supply of food and some combat masters, it could probably serve as a defensive foothold for at least one and a half years. At this moment, the carriage had arrived at the inner castle's courtyard. There was a small garden in the courtyard decorated with neatly trimmed greenery. This slightly dispelled the dark and humid atmosphere present in the castle. The main castle gate lay behind the courtyard. Link saw three people standing in front of the main gate, awaiting his arrival. There were two women and one man. The two women were dressed in tattered and thin clothes, causing them to shiver in the cold winter. They constantly rubbed their hands against each other and stamped their feet to keep their bodies warm. As Link got closer, their facial features evoked Link's memory and he finally recognized them. The women with the distressed and worried expression were Lilith, the mother of the true Link Morani. The disheveled lady beside her was his elder sister Molly, and the last person with a head of white hair was the housekeeper of the Morani family, Trevor. Mother is in the castle? This is unexpected, Link thought. As for his eldest brother, it was normal for him to not appear due to his revolting temperament. Similarly, his second brother was a kingdom knight and was on duty at the Silver Fortress in the north. It was thus natural that he would not be around as well. The carriage stopped right in front of the main gate. Link opened the door and alighted with grace. Link did not want to be looked down upon by his family members. He wore his turquoise magic robe bearing the crest of the East Cove Higher Magic Academy and had two rings on his hand. One of them was an intricately designed ring bearing the defensive spell, Edelweiss. The second one was a ring given by the king that would affirm his status as a duke. The wand of constellations he deliberately held in his hand also constantly emitted a mysterious and glorious glow. This was extremely effective. Lilith's eyes lit up the moment she saw her son in this manner. She immediately felt relieved, the signs of distress previously shown on her face dissipated. His sister Molly had also regained some spirit, covering her mouth in shock. They probably did not expect their incompetent brother would grow this much. The contempt on Trevor's face had also greatly lessened, changing into that of respect and awe. He bowed and said, Third young master, Is this really you, Link? Molly doubted her own eyes. The Morani family had always placed emphasis on physical strength and walked the path of the night. Link, who was frail and weak from young was thus despised. However, the young man standing in front of them was lean and confident. He was dressed in a glorious robe and had the demeanor of an extremely powerful magician. This was the exact opposite of the impression she had of her brother. It's me, Link smiled. Even though he did not hold special feelings towards these two women, memories of the true Link Morani were still present inside him. He couldn't help but feel some sort of intimacy. He walked forward and hugged his sister and mother respectively. When he embraced his mother, Link found the poor woman trembling. He then looked at her and saw tears flowing down her cheek as she stared hard at him. She murmured, That's good, my son has finally grown up. He looks promising. Link felt a twinge of pain in his heart. He let out a small sigh before recollecting himself. He turned towards the coachman and handed him five gold coins. Al, please take a rest. You will have to stay in the castle these few days. Sorry for the trouble. The moment the coachman saw the gold coins, his eyes lit up. Five gold coins were the equivalent of six months of his earnings. He was elated and spoke with excitement. Thank you, sir. Housekeeper Trevor gasped at the sight. He gave the coachman five gold coins as a trip. The entire Morani family merely had an annual income of 700 gold coins. With this income, they had to further split it amongst the 300 over people in the castle. The most generous reward the duke offered in the past year was five silver coins. To think that Link could offer ten times that amount off the mark, it exceeded his expectations in every way. 
The winter breeze was making the cold unbearable. Link could not watch as his mother and sister turned pale in the howling wind. He said, Mother, sister, let's go in. All right, all right. Lilith's only focus was on her son. She would follow whatever Link said. As for Molly, she was similarly shocked by Link's lavish action. Her allowance for the entire year was merely six gold coins. She still remembered her struggle when she wanted to purchase a skirt that had cost one gold coin. It took her half a month to come to a decision. She clearly did not expect her brother to tip a coachman an amount that was almost equivalent to her yearly allowance. How extravagant! She followed closely behind Link with a stunned expression, her eyes staring at her brother the whole time. On the way, Link told the housekeeper, I want to see my father, bring me there. Trevor instinctively said, The Duke is currently weak, no visitors are allowed. That was far from the truth. While the Duke was indeed physically weak, it was Hamilton's eldest son, also the person next in line for the position of Duke, Wharton Morani's instruction that the third young master was not allowed to visit the seriously ill Duke. The reason was simple. He was afraid some of the inheritance would go to Link. In the past, Trevor would say these things with ease. However, before he could even complete his sentence this time, his speech was interrupted by Link's cold stare. There was not the slightest bit of emotion in those eyes. He immediately felt pressurized the moment their gaze met. He panicked and sweat broke out on his forehead. He subconsciously muttered, Third young master, this is your brother's order. Link sneered. He knew exactly what Wharton was planning. The Morani family's inheritance was sparse to begin with. If Wharton had to split this inheritance with him, Wharton's portion would definitely become smaller. However, Link had no interest in such an insignificant inheritance. He calmly spoke. I request to see my father and not my brother. Lead the way. Yes. Trevor found himself completely subservient to this young man and agreed immediately. The moment he spoke, he was horrified. Since when did the third master become so powerful? This is weird. Now that he had agreed, there was no reason to delay the process. Trevor led the way with a pained expression. When they reached the staircase, a figure appeared on the second floor. A voice came in that direction. My dear brother, you have finally returned. I missed you so much. Link looked up and saw a burly young man walk down the stairs. The man was in his early thirties. He had shoulder-length brown curls and neatly trimmed stubble. He was well-built and wore a brand new black robe with a high-quality fur vest. His shoes were made of exquisite deer leather, and the accessories he wore were double the amount of the total his mother and sister wore altogether. The sight of this person struck fear into the hearts of his mother and sister. They immediately bowed their heads like a deer shivering in the face of a lion. This was the eldest brother of the true Link Morani, the successor to the throne, Wharton Morani. He slowly walked down the stairs and observed Link with great interest. His smile grew wider by the minute and said, My dear brother, it seems like you have learned your magic well. Look at your beautiful wand, let me have a look at it. He then proceeded to grab the wand from Link without asking for his permission. This was an old habit. His third brother would never refuse his requests. However, that was Link from the past. This pampered bastard meant nothing to him now. Link's mana surged into the wand, causing it to glow in a blinding light. Under the illumination of this light, Link looked at his arrogant brother and said, This is not something you should be touching, Wharton. A magician's wand is like a warrior's sword. It should never be in the possession of another person, not even for a moment. Wharton's expression immediately changed. His face darkened and with his hands still stretched, the brilliance of a strong battle aura enveloped his body. He advanced forward. Why is that so? Have my little brother lost all respect after learning some magic? He specialized in the Morani's family ice battle aura and was already a level 4 warrior. He was confident that he would be considered a formidable foe even if his strength was compared across the kingdom. On the other hand, his brother had only studied magic for less than a year. How strong could a person get after merely a year of practice? The blinding light is probably just something flashy. He then made an extremely unwise decision. The next moment, 
A brilliant light enveloped Link's body and a level 4 Edelweiss spell was instantly released. Link controlled the energy field carefully and made sure not to injure his mother, sister, and the housekeeper. However, on Wharton's side, he deliberately enhanced the strength of the force field. Boom! Wharton was caught unguarded and his whole body was knocked back. You little punk! How dare you attack me? Wharton was enraged. He had been holding the reins in the Morani family for a few years. Even his father dared not go against his will, much less his third brother who had always been meek and frail. To think that he could retaliate. The anger inside him was overflowing. He charged forward following an explosion of his battle aura. He had to teach this disobedient brother a lesson. That's the end. Please subscribe to A7 English Podcasts and enjoy listening every day with us. Thank you.